He is a dynamic political commentator, as well as an author of several books, some that are my personal favorite, like Beyond the Download, as well as his most recent book, Quitting, and another book I think a lot of us Black gay men who really know what the struggle is about, remember, which is One More River to Cross. That's a good one as well as a Harvard Law School graduate. Come on, Black man. <laughs> and he was an aide to former President Bill Clinton. I'm talking about the one and only Keith Boykin. How are you? I'm doing well, Samson. How are you? Good to see you. I want to start with this one quote mm. uh, that I know is associated with you by Audre Lorde. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. How does this quote connect to the work that you've done and continue to do or the life that you live as a, as a very openly uh, Black gay man? It just symbolizes everything I believe about the work because I like what she says. She says, when I dare to be powerful, acknowledging that we all have power, to use my strength in the service of my vision. So we're not just using our strength or power just to make ourselves more powerful or to, 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 to make ourselves uh, uh, more personally successful, but use it in the service of a larger vision. Then it becomes less and less important, she says, whether I am afraid. And she doesn't say you won't be afraid. She says it becomes less important whether you are. So I love that that statement because I think it's a reflection of the fact that we all have fear uh, and that when you are acting in the service of a larger purpose, a larger goal, then that fear becomes less important. Uh, it doesn't disappear, but it becomes less important. And for me, fear is a real thing, but fear need not stop us. You know, we, I think, tend to think of courage in our country and in our society as sort of the absence of fear. But I like to think of courage as the ability or willingness to act in spite of fear, which is, I think, what Audre Lorde is telling us. So I, I can just think of so many examples in my life from uh, being in the Million Man March with an openly gay contingent of 200, 300 other Black gay men in 1995, meeting with Minister Farrakhan in 2005 to talk about uh, Black LGBTQ SGL participation in the, in the Million Man March anniversary, uh, working in the White House, um, being on CNN, um, just standing up for the causes that I believed in. I led a campaign back in the 90s, I think it was, early 2000s, with my colleague Jasmine Kanick. Uh, it was called Outing Black Pastors. It's very controversial. Uh, we didn't actually out anybody, but everybody thought we were going to. But we just, we would, we raised the point, all these homophobic pastors who were out there, that um, the people who are the most homophobic tend to be usually the people who have their own issues. Uh, we didn't call anybody out by name, but we did mention a lot of people who were very homophobic. Some of them have changed since that time. Um, and, you know, when you are on the front lines on these issues, you, you always you always take a lot of slings and arrows. You know, people are always attacking you, criticizing you. I've made plenty of enemies, plenty of enemies in my life, in my day. Um, <laughs> And I'm not, I don't even like having enemies. I don't, I don't, have, I don't consider any of these people to be my enemies, I, I, but you know, I, I just feel like the work is more important than personalities. So there is a, a sense of denial about sexuality in the black community. What causes that? What do you think needs to happen between the black gay community and the black community for us to work on solving that issue a little bit? Black communities were actually much more open and embracing toward homosexuality until the 1980s. Um, and I don't have a lot of firsthand proof for this because I wasn't around at that time. But, you know, I I did live through part of the 60s and 70s because I was alive, but I wasn't old enough to fully appreciate what was going on. But I had, I had an openly gay uncle uh, in the 1970s who was murdered in 1980. But he uh, was very well received in the community from what I could perceive. Uh, and all of the, I don't ever remember seeing or hearing any of the sort of homophobic uh, sermons from the pastors in the 70s and the churches that I went to. I don't remember that until the 1980s. 
And my theory is that HIV AIDS is what led to that. The, the, the fear of HIV, the fear that this was stigmatizing the black community is what led to this whole sort of, uh, this rampant homophobia in black communities. Uh, followed by, and I don't mean this as a critique of hip hop, but followed by hip hop, uh, in the 1990s, which led to, I think, the the, the hyper masculinization of, of of black manhood, which is something that even black gay men contributed to. So I think those two com those two factors combined helped to create this period from the 80s until the until at least the end of the the 2000s, uh, 2000, uh, the first 2000s, the aughts, is that what they call it? Um, from 1981 until about 2012, I'd say, probably the most homophobic period in, in Black American history. Uh, but if you go before 1981, you look at, at the people who were involved in the community. Like I said, look at the Bayard Rustins and, and, and Alvin Ailey's and look at, the, look at the role of James Baldwin, you know, who was openly gay. Look at what uh, what Bobby Seale, I think it was, the, from the Black Panther Party, wrote about Black gay men in the 1970s, how open and embracing he was. Now, mind you, not everybody was. There are people like Eldridge Cleaver who were openly homophobic. I get that. But... Uh, but there was a lot of, it seems to me, a, a lot of understanding that it, 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 that Black LGBTQIA people were part of the community um, and, and that age. That's my perception. And then it just kind of changed in the 1980s. Again, I would love to see some research to document this theory because I've been saying this for a long time. I don't have any actual evidence about this, but um, but that's just my perception of how things have changed. You did say that the black community wasn't as as critical of the black LGBTQ community up until the 80s. There was an incident that occurred uh, around the March on Washington, which if people don't know, Bayard Rustin, an openly uh, gay black man organized uh, where there was some pushback about that because they felt like his presence would weaken the the uh, the idea of black men. What is your opinion about that? Well, that's true. And, th and that's also related to this politics of respectability. You know, Baird Rustin was arrested in Pasadena, California, I think in 1953, on what they call a morals charge. I think he was arrested in the bathroom for having sex or allegedly having sex with another man or something like that. Um, and that was something that was part of his record. Some people knew that, some people didn't know that. Um, I imagine Dr. King knew that uh, because it was an issue that was presented to him. It became an issue in 1963 when Dr. King appointed, Bayard, well, he wasn't the one, but the, the, the civil rights community appointed Bayard Rustin to run the March on Washington. Uh, but because there was some pushback, uh, there was some pushback from a couple of people. The first was um, Adam Clayton Powell, um, mm -hmm. who um, was a congressman from Harlem. He was opposed to this idea and he pushed back on it. Uh, and another was Strom Thurmond, <laughs> the, uh, the racist, uh, conservative, at that time Democrat, later Republican, segregationist senator from South Carolina. Uh, and Strom Thurmond, I think, threatened to expose Bayard Rustin's um, criminal history in association with communism and homosexuality. And because of that reason, Dr. King and the, and the associates who were, who were organizing the march, they didn't remove him, Bayard Rustin, from uh, the role of running the march, but they gave him a lower title and they made A. Philip Randolph the, the chair of the march. Uh, but Bayard Rustin was the person who organized the march. And the march was also a part of respectability politics, too. If you look at the, the, the march instructions that they gave to people back in 1963, the march was August 28, 1963. They told people what to wear, where, you know, how to dress, how to look, how to talk. You know, they wanted people to, to be very presentable because they knew they were creating an image for the public to see. Uh, and they didn't want anything that was going to distract from that. So I, I think that Dr. King understood, he obviously understood that, that Beard Rustin was gay and and I think it caused some issues with uh, his association with other people in the community. But I don't I don't believe that Dr. King ever completely distanced himself because of that. I think, you know, he did what he needed to do to protect the movement, he thought. But I think um, Dr. King understood 
that LGBTQIA people had a role to play in the community. I definitely know that Coretta Scott King felt that way because I met Coretta Scott King when she was alive. I spoke to her. I was a. I marched in uh, one of the marches in one of the marches in Atlanta, the Dr. King marches, and sort of the Grand Marshal in the 1990s. Um, and her assistant, her top aide, uh, Lynn Cawthorn, was an openly gay man, uh, and she was uh, one of the first people to speak out in favor of marriage equality. Uh, and she would always quote Dr. King's message that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I, I think it's a legacy. Uh, it's a complicated legacy because in the 1960s, um, I'm not suggesting that black people were 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 so op openly pro-gay that that we had no problem with it at all in any of our communities. That's not the case. I am suggesting that I don't think that it was as much of an issue in our communities as it was in the 1980s after HIV AIDS. Let's talk about Keith Boykin a little bit. Tell us uh, where are you from and when did you first uh, recognize that you were attracted to other men? I grew up in St. Louis, went to high school in Florida, college in New Hampshire. And then when I was in law school in uh, 1990, I came out. And I know that's a problematic term, but that's just the term I was using because a lot of people are, uh, in the Black queer, Black queer space are using the term uh, inviting in. I understand that. I respect that. I'm not trying to take anything away from that. Uh, the, in my experience at that time, it was a coming out experience. I went to a local bookstore um, in Harvard Square, and I found a book that seemed to speak to me about my identity. I kind of nervously purchased the book and slipped it into my backpack and took it home and read that book that night. Uh, and then the next day I came out to my mom. I called her up on the phone in uh, Paline, Texas, where she was at Fort Hood Army Base, living with her husband at that time. Um, uh, and um, I uh, had a very difficult conversation with her um, because, you know, you can't just call, I mean, you, get, you could, right? I, I I didn't, you know, I don't know how you just call up your mom and say, hey, I'm gay, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, it takes, it takes some time to get to the point where you, you want to say the thing you want to say. And I, after I stumbled around for a while, I finally managed to, 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 to say what I needed to say to her. And then she told me that she loved me, huh, which was a relief, and the most important thing I needed to hear from her. And she asked me questions. She said, are you sure? I said, yes. She said, um, was it something I did? I said, no. Um, she said, well, maybe you just haven't met the right woman yet. I said, no, I don't think that's it either. Um, and she gave me some advice. She said she loved me, but she told me, don't tell too many people. Um, and, you know, especially not my grandmother, because it'll just kill your grandmother. She hears about this. And she said, be safe and be careful. So I definitely, I took her advice about being careful and being safe, but um, I didn't listen to her about uh, not telling too many people uh, because I remember when I was very young, my, my mom used to always tell me, uh, don't let anybody tell you what to do. So I remembered her earlier advice and I disregarded her new advice and I just started telling people. I went to campus and told a few people on campus and it was a very liberating experience for me to do that. Uh, but I also realized I didn't want to go through that over and over and over again, I have to come out and come out and come out. I wanted people to know, but I didn't want to have to tell them. And so that's when I discovered um, um, the first rule of coming out, which is that if you tell the right people, you don't have to tell everybody else. So I told a few people, everybody else seemed to find out without my telling them. And uh, it worked wonders. Even one of my professors at the law school um, found out. And after a meeting, he came up to me, uh, he closed the door in his office and after I had a meeting and he kind of leaned over his desk and he said, I heard that you're gay now, is that true? And I was like, yeah, I am. But how did you know? And he told me that one of the other professors told him about it. And I was thinking, well, I thought the professors at Harvard Law School had more important things to do with their time. But, you know, here they were speculating about the sexual orientation of one of their students. Uh, and it was just a, it was just overall a very positive experience for me. There was a place to come out for a person in the 1990s, early 1990s uh, or in 1990. Harvard was probably one of the best places to do it, except for the, the fact there were no black people there. Um, and so a year later, when I graduated from law school, I found a partner at that point who was Black, who was living in Boston. And my partner came to my graduation ceremony. And um, while I was on stage to get my degree, my grandmother had a conversation with him and told him that she did not approve of my lifestyle, as she put it. Uh, and then we had a whole argument about that when I found out about it. And, you know, my grandmother wanted to get my partner's mom's phone number so she could call his mother or something. 
But my grandmother was raised in this whole sort of black church tradition that, that said there was something wrong with homosexuality, even though, by the way, her everybody in her choir was gay and her church choir was gay <laughs> and her hairdresser was gay. And whenever I asked her about that, she said, like, I don't know nothing about those people. Uh, but, um, but, you know, there's this whole sort of don't ask, don't tell hypocrisy in the black church at that time back in the 90s, probably in a lot of churches still even today. Um, and it wasn't. It was an experience I didn't think we were going to get through. But years later, when I wrote my first book and came out to um, to St. Louis to do a book signing, my grandmother showed up at the book signing. She brought some of the members of her church with her. Uh, they were very quiet and didn't say anything. They all sat in the first few rows. And then after the uh, book signing was over, uh, they all came up to me. And I wasn't sure they are going to like lay hands on me or something. But they came up to me and and they spoke to me and they told me that my grandmother, without even telling me, uh, invited them, printed up invitations to the event and invited them to come to my book signing. Uh, and then uh, not only that, she actually gave an invitation to the church announcer the Sunday before I came to St. Louis. So the church announcer could read about it in the bulletin before uh, so, that, so people in the community could know about the event. But um, the church announcer made a mistake when she read the bulletin because the bulletin said, the family of Keith Boy can invite you to a book signing for his first book, One More River to Cross, Black and Gay in America. And the church announcer said, the family of Keith Boy can invite you to a book signing for his first book, One More River to Cross, Black and Gray in America. And I think she said that, made that mistake because she just assumed it couldn't possibly be a book about Black LGBTQ people or Black gay people. It had to be a book about Black senior citizens or something like that. It just had to be a mistake or a misprint. Uh, but it was just a lesson about that same that same value that Audre Lorde talked about before from the beginning of this conversation. But when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. I was afraid. I didn't want to tell my family, tell my grandmother, tell these people who I'd loved and known all my life, this, this, this part of my identity that I didn't know how they were going to react to in 1990. Um, and yet, I'm so glad that I did. Uh, because um, my mere act of daring to be powerful allowed me to live a life of freedom and, and life of, of meaning and purpose uh, in, in the community and doing so in a way that's open and honest about who I am. How did you manage to come to terms with your sexuality? I think it was just a reality that I, I couldn't deny it anymore. I was 25 years old at that point in my life. I'd never had sex with a man before. Um, and yet I knew it was something that, you know, there, there, there's something in me that was stirring for years that I just kind of repressed. I remember one time when I was in my first year in law school, I was dating this girl, this woman, a black woman, classmate. We were coming home from church, walking up from church in Cambridge, and she grabbed my hand. And um, I don't know, I don't remember doing this, but she claims, I'm sure she's telling the truth, I'm just saying that, but, but she says that I, I pulled away from her. And I was like, I don't remember doing that. I didn't do that. She says, yeah, you always do that. I was like, really? I, I, didn't, I didn't realize I'd done it. You know, totally subconscious. And I said, well, you know, I'm just not a, a person who believes in PDA. I'm not into public displays of affection. Now, mind you, after I came out <laughs> and started dating this beautiful brother I met in, uh, in Boston, we were holding hands and was gall galloping and skipping <laughs> through sure. Boston everywhere. <laughs> I was like, I guess it wasn't about not, not being in the public displays of affection after all. It was just about where my natural inclination was. So, um, you know, I, I started to come to terms with who I was because um, I had allowed myself to repress a lot of that for most of my young life because I was so busy working on other things. Um, I was trying to, you know, make it through high school. I was always active in high school. I was the president of my student government. I was running track and playing football on the wrestling team. I went to college. I was in varsity track team in college and the editor of my school newspaper. And, and then I went to work on the campaign. And then I went to work in law school and I uh, was involved in a, in a diversity movement in law school and protesting and suing the law school. And I was just busy doing stuff from the, from the time I like became politically conscious until the time I, until the present, I've just been always engaged, but I never really engaged in my sort of social uh, inclinations or desires. I just kind of put that to the side. Um, and then I realized why, 
you know, what, what am I accomplishing by this? I think at some, in, in the back of my head, at some level, I thought I might want to run for office at one point. I thought, well, I'll never be able to run for office if I'm gay. Um, but that was the thinking back in the 1990s. Um, I mean, I didn't, I went to law school with Barack Obama too. And I, I didn't realize he was going to become president of the United States. But, you know, when back in 1990, nobody thought, nobody knew any of these things. You know, we, we didn't know there's going to be gay marriage or a black president or anything like we were. We were just uh, trying to make it through the uh, the Reagan Bush years, and um, yeah, it's, at some point you have to make a decision, which I did at that at that point, which is that it's more important for me to be true to myself and live a life of honesty than it is to to try to serve any sort of uh, larger um, political or financial objective. I, I didn't care if I didn't, didn't get the job, the career I wanted, or didn't get in politics or anything. I just wanted to be free because I was tired of not being free. Biggest challenge that you've had to overcome as a Black gay man? I don't know. I haven't, I've never been asked that question before. A struggle I did have is that I have su I've had such an unusual life, uh, especially in the 1990s, that I never really felt like there was any place that I fit in, you know, I definitely didn't fit in the white LGBTQ community. Um, and I, I'd always fit in the black community, but I was, I was out there as an activist leading black gay organizations in the 1990s. So I was the enemy of a lot of black people in the 1990s. People hated me because I was on TV, on BET and all these other channels all the time, black radio stations, people were cussing me out. You know, because I because I was calling them out. They were saying stupid crap like, oh, well, you know, Jesus is opposed to homosexuality. I said, well, Jesus never mentioned homosexuality. And, and they said, oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. I said, well, tell me where in the Bible it mentioned it. And they quote things, of, you know, they thought they knew about Genesis and Leviticus. Now we have the response to them, like how they completely misinterpreted what they were saying. And they just didn't like me. You know, imagine doing that in the 1990s when the black community was not very open or receptive to to black gay people at that time in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, especially. So uh, that was a that was a challenging period for me because I I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. And even in the black queer spaces, there were people in you know black activists and political black gay activists and black gay political people who embraced me. But there are a lot of black gay people, black gay men who I encountered who were just not there. And they were just, they were very uncomfortable around me because I was too out there for them, you know? And like, they saw me on TV and they, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't like, I didn't, it wasn't like threatening in terms of my appearance, but threatening in terms of the fact that I was too well known. Um, and so, you know, it was a very isolating experience in some ways, just being out there by yourself, saying things, uh, doing things when there's not a lot of other people out there who are, who are doing that. Um, so I had some friends who were in those circles, but, you know, a lot of times I meet some people who thought, oh, he's cute, whatever, and then find out, no, they didn't want anything to do with me because they, I was too out, you know, for them, so. Last question. Mm -hmm. You're very, you're very politically engaged, and that's something that um, a lot of people think they don't have to be a part of. Why is it important for more of us to be politically aware, politically active, politically engaged? And what ways would you encourage, particularly Black queer, Black gay, same gender loving people to get more politically active? Well, I think it's a great question. And I don't think that politics has to be just sort of electoral politics. I mean, on the one hand, yes, the, you, we can all vote. That's the, the very minimum, bare, min, bare minimum we could do, vote. Um, you can support candidates. You can give money to candidates. Uh, you can run for office yourself. That's all sort of traditional electoral politics. But there are other things we could do to be politically active too, which is support causes that we believe in. Um, you know, not just like posting a, a photo on social media, but but actually um, being informed, uh, getting informed, educating ourselves about our own culture and community and history and, and issues, um, supporting people and causes that are important to us, um, and um, finding a way to build a sense of community. This is one of my big issues, I think, moving forward in, in the next generation, finding a way to build a sense of community that is constructive. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a long tradition in many of our communities of sort of, I don't want to use the word cattiness, but I can't think of a better word, 
uh, people, we, you know, I, I, we've all, I think we've all been sort of in some ways indoctrinated or led to believe or, or inculcated into the idea that part of black queerness is sort of being able to, uh, to be able to fire back at somebody whenever they, they come at us, you know, and, and uh, to, I get that. I'm not sure I, I'm describing it well. Do you understand what I'm saying at all? Like reading each other, throwing shade. Yeah, I guess reading, throwing shade, those are better, better ways to say it, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other ways to say it, but those are the best ways to say it. Um, and I, 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 you know, I think, I can't say that I've never been a part of that, um, but I can say that I don't think it's healthy for us as a community to continue finding ways to divide ourselves instead of finding ways to uh, to uh, to grow ourselves. Now, when somebody needs to be called out, we call them out. I, I do believe in accountability. Whenever people do wrong, you know, including myself, we should all be held accountable. Nobody is above that. But I also believe that we should find ways to be um, more loving toward each other, um, more supportive of each other. Uh, being black and gay, being black and queer, being black and same gender loving, being black and lesbian, bisexual, transgender questioning or any other identity uh, these days is difficult. And uh, we never know what people are going through and struggling through. And so I, I just wanna find ways for us to encourage people to, to do that. Um, it's not always easy. Well, Keith Boykin, it has been an honor to uh, speak with you again and hear about your experiences. And, and witness your passion about what you're doing. Thank you for all that you do and for how you show up for our community. Thank you so much, Samson. It's always a pleasure to see you and uh, always enjoy to have a conversation with you.